Hello and welcome to today's Redback webinar where we're going to be uncovering the Redback report for 2020. We're so excited because as we all know, it's been a crazy year for online events and this is our eighth year where we've actually gone and discovered insights and trends into how people run webinars and what people's preferences are when they attend webinars. So we know that 2020 has been like no other. The impact of COVID has changed the world of events forever, especially those that are virtual. Today is all about uncovering the findings that have come up in the report, going through them to make sure that you understand them in detail, and then also providing you with some tips to make sure that you can run awesome events that really stand out from the rest. So we encourage you to participate and ask questions as we'll be going through them throughout the webinar. I'd like to welcome Michael. How are you? Good, Sarah. Thanks for having me. Great. So Michael's going to be discussing some of the content with me as we go through today. And it's great to have you on, Michael, because we're both very passionate about different types of events. That's very true. And different applications in events as well. Um, before before we get started and get into the data, I really want to encourage you to submit your questions throughout. So to do that, please click on the dark blue raise hand icon in the top right corner of your screen. We will also be referring obviously to the report and some other accessible material. So to access your copy of the report and also additional information, you can click on the light blue drop down arrow. And of course, towards the end of the webinar, we'll be asking you to submit your feedback. Obviously, because we like to improve our own webinars, don't oh, we? Oh, absolutely. Okay, so let's get straight into the respondents and the sort of data that we collected. So we actually surveyed over 100 qualitative um, respondents. Very nice. So we went out and they completed around a five to 10 minute survey. And if you are online and you did complete that, a huge thank you because the insights were amazing that we captured through there. And then we also went back and we actually looked over 1,500 events in the past 12 months. Mm -hmm. And we've had such a huge variety of events, haven't we? Oh God, they've all been... The three standard ones, yep. the normal ones, the remote studio and customer venue, but the applications for how they've used yep. um, have been very varied. And this data was great <clears> because it allowed us to understand how our customers are running events, but then the other data that we captured in terms of people's responses allowed us to understand people's preferences. So combining the two of those made for some great insights. As you'll see by the graph on your screen, uh, this actually goes through the types of people who completed the survey. So one in three are actually from the corporate sector and mm -hmm. 42% hailed from the not-for-profit sector. And I think a big part of this, Michael, is that yep. we know that associations and membership organisations have been using webinars for so long. And when COVID did hit, they really adapted quite quickly because they already had these in place, didn't they? They did. Well, they were able to utilise their programs for CPD and other mm. stuff to use other external communications. Yep. So it was really great to see them pivot quite quickly. And I know everyone's heard pivot way too much, but yep. we'll say it a couple of <laughs> times today. So I do apologise for that. But it was great to see so many people from the third sector it was also nice to see 7% came from government. And I well. think stakeholder engagement is definitely on the increase when it yeah. comes to government organisations. Um, and the applications, as we'll see in this report, have just blown us out of the water. People have been so creative. Um, so why do we attend events? And I think it's important for us as webinar organisers and planners to understand this when we're creating content, to understand why people attend and the types of events that they want to attend. So 30%, first of all, I'll just give you um, a stat which I thought was very overwhelming. 30% <laughs> of respondents said that they attend over 10 events per month. Which is massive. Which is huge. Yeah. And a further 34% said they attend 6 to, to 10, 10 yeah. events per month. So that's more than two a week. Absolutely. And I, it's, it's more than two a week. But you also got to wonder, is have these increase in events just not just replace the physical trainings and stuff that they were doing face-to-face, yeah. -face, but are people doing even more because they can't? And I think the insight from that as well is when we did this survey last year, yeah. when we asked people the same question, only 2% said that they were attending um, <laughs> over 10 per month. Yeah. And when it came to those who attend between 6 to 10, that was 5%. Yeah. So as you can see, there's been a huge increase from 2% to 30% and 5% to 34%. Yep. And that just goes to show how people are attending and what, what they're actually expecting. Another thing I'll also note is um, we conducted another survey during COVID, as mm -hmm. you know, around remote working and people's um, experiences. And 80% of people who have been working from home said they want to continue when they re-enter the workforce. Yeah. And I think we've seen that shift um, as a lot of the restrictions have been lifted as well with people adapting this sort of hybrid approach, approach where some are still going into the office. And I think it's going to be like that for events as well, yeah. where you're never going to replace that face-to-face -face component. And as face-to-face -face events and physical events really come back into play, you're still going to have that hybrid approach because people want it, don't they? 
They do, they do. And it allows you also to come <clears throat> expand that physical event into more touch points as well. Yeah. So a great hybrid approach is definitely on the rise. And, you know, we can see here learning, education, yeah. development is still one of the top reasons um, when they're all combined why people actually attend. So... We know that events are on the rise. Yes. There's no secret there. Um, but can we just take a look into how much we think they're on the rise and do people expect to attend more as we move into 2020 and 2021? Oh, absolutely. I think looking at the stats and seeing that they're going to be attending more and it's just because of the ease of the technology now. Yeah. The apprehension of running digital events a couple of years ago where people were really scared about the technology, they now see it works. Mm, yeah. So people are looking at their programs, they're looking at what they're going to be doing. 51% uh, ex uh, expect to attend more, which is great. Mm. And it allows people to be a little bit more creative with, with yep. what they're trying to achieve as well. Mm. So that's the exciting stuff to see here. Mm. Um, I love the fact that 2% nowhere near as many after this, and you're always going to have those people in your stats. Yeah. But I reckon it, we will see a continuation of not just more around the digital events that we see, the traditional live ones, but a lot more around the on-demand strategy, a lot more around the mm. content creation strategy, because not everything needs to be live. Do you think we've hit our peak? Definitely not. No. No, no, no. I just think the peak, it's, I don't think it's going to be a peak because mm. it's going to be a, a ever-evolving mm. landscape of how these virtual events yeah. are being done. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, the next section I want to go into now is live and on demand. And I want to spend yeah. some time on this because it's always contentious when we speak to our customers <laughs> and consult with our customers. But it also has seen a massive change over the past 12 months. Mm -hmm. So while we're attending more and more events, we're also attending more and more live. And Michael, I think this is interesting because over the past probably five years, we've seen a dramatic decrease in the types of people attending events live. So yep. your average attendance rate has dropped to around 35 to 40 percent. Mm -hmm. And that's average. And that's just because it's the way that we digest content now. Yes. It's on demand. Right. It's this Netflix generation. We want to watch stuff when we want to want it. We don't necessarily want to watch it live. And there's pros and cons for both. We understand. Yes, there are. Um, but it's important to note that this year, 83 percent of respondents are attending at least half of all the digital events they watch live. So that's pretty huge. That's massive. That's I think. massive stuff. Um, and then you've got people who always register and wait for the on-demand version. And for everyone out there looking to create their series, one bit of advice is to make sure that you don't get hung up on your live attendance rate. And no. I think that's one of the mistakes that many people make early on in their webinar programs. They tend to focus on the live attendance and they use that as a measure of investment. So, okay, how what am I measuring the success of my event on? Mm -hmm. I'm going to see how many people attend live. Just because those people are live, it doesn't mean that they're necessarily more engaged. No. So you really need to consider your on-demand strategy. But I think it's really interesting that people are attending more events live. It is. And I think it's also funny to look at the stats where people still say that they're registering just for the on-demand. Yep. But I wonder how many people that register for the on-demand actually then go back and watch it. Yeah, and I think as well, like, people are just busy. They are, they yeah. are. And they want to, <laughs> when people are digesting content and that very much Netflix style, it's at the click of a button. Mm. You don't want to be waiting for something. So. Yeah. so what does this all mean and how can this help us as event organisers and planners? Um, and when it comes to increasing live viewership, I think you mentioned pre-recorded content before and that's yeah. on the rise, isn't it? It is. People are wanting more polished, professional-looking content, mm. but it's also removing the burden of, again, a lot of our presenters aren't used to digital events. Mm. So that security blanket of being able to know, like, look, I can pre-record it, I get to review it, maybe edit a bit, mm. and then play it back as if it was live. So then it could either be some live engagement still mm. or just purely on-demand content. But this pre-recorded content is, it's... Again, people are aware of the fact that it's not all about the live. Yep. You can still have the live element mm -hmm. of it, but you are trying to create a really professional piece of content as well that's going to live past that live event. So pre-record definitely gives you that ability to do that. I also think um, there has been an increase in pre-recorded content, and this is also something to consider when it comes to planning your events, mm -hmm. is because we've seen such an increase in people attending remotely. So people, <laughs> presenters are attending. Statistically, the more people you have present remotely, the more issues you're going to have, as far as I'm concerned. So we've got more remote presenters. We've got more unreliable internet connections. Yeah. And doing on-demand content just gives you that peace of mind. But I still think there is room to mix up your live and pre-recorded yes. content. Absolutely. Uh, look, and 
as you talked about, remote presenters, that's just risk. And the more remote presenters that you have, it's the more failure points that you can yeah. potentially have with internet. So especially high profile mm. international speakers or anyone that's coming in, Think about, like, can I have this pre-recorded and then create a polished piece of content that I can insert mm. into my live event? And every time that you do that, it removes one failure point mm. for each one of those that you do. So it's a great strategy to do. It allows you to also put to ease the presenter's apprehension for maybe mm. having to use their own technology. Because remote presenters, they are controlling their slides, their computer, mm. everything. And it can be a little bit daunting. So yeah. by removing these things, you're trying to more focus on making that presenter comfortable and creating the good content. And so while we all know that pre-recorded content is great, there is obviously still a place for live viewership. Mm -hmm. So what are some tips for increasing live viewers? Because I think at the end of the day, the pros of live viewership are the is interaction, yeah. the ability to ask questions and interact with people. And it's also depends on the types of people's personality. I always think the people who are going to attend your events live are the ones that are going to attend networking events, oh, you know, physical <laughs> events. They're the people who want to participate and engage. So we need to cater to all types of people. So how do we increase live viewership? Well, there's a couple of easy tips. And one of them is, I think, our standard, our favourite one, is get people to pre-submit questions. By getting people to pre-submit questions, mm -hmm. it does get them invested in the event because they're going to want to see if that question was actually answered online. So that draws them into the event. Create some urgency with simu live events. And when mm. we talk about simulated live, that can be the pre recorded content played as if it was live. But what it also can allow you to do is instead of having these massive lead times of like two or three weeks of registrations, mm. if you have that on demand content pre recorded and created, you could do a last minute event. So there's a sense of urgency for it. So it's like, hey guys, this week on Thursday, you release this on Monday. Tune in live, we're gonna have this person. Yeah. It's an easy way of knocking out quick events if you have that content pre-done, and definitely that urgency will drive numbers up because yeah. they're not competing against other things in the calendar. Mm. Use the blended approach, play recorded files at the end, um, have one of your speakers and moderators appear live to answer the question. So that's combining the, the simu live with create the content before, and then at the end of it, still beam in your presenters that you use to do the live Q&A so you don't lose mm. out on those elements. There was one more that I was going to say, but it's just completely lost my mind. So I'm we're sure just going to move on to it. To it. <laughs> <laughs> so we also uh, mentioned virtual conferences and applications and things that we've seen come out mm -hmm. of um, the pandemic and the way that people are being more creative with the types of events they're running. Yeah. So what types of events are people attending these days or have they been attending over the past six months or so? I love looking at the stats that we have mm. right now because I think a lot of these things people are classifying as in a digital event as a very broad spectrum. It's very broad. It's very broad. And there are the two different platforms that you look at. Like right now, we're doing a live webinar. It's broadcast only. A lot of the stuff that we see that came back from the report are generally collaborative meetings. Mm. So like briefings, workshops, those are the two-way communications. But we can see webinars are still number one. 26% yeah. of people have come in for that. Um, the customer meetings at 11% mm. some briefings. Like I like the fact that we're seeing an incline of these, but what's really stood out this year and forced people to do it is mm. the virtual conferences. Yeah. Yeah. People have um, done the hybrid approach for years, so streaming a couple of the keynotes or maybe streaming the whole thing, but mm. having the physical audience there, people were forced now to take a fully digital approach to it. And it's pushed our boundaries of what we were doing beforehand and how we we're going to change the technology, but it forced a lot of event organizers to be really creative, not just for delivering the virtual event, yeah. but also how they're going to benefit the sponsors and mm. everything and what they were doing for them as well. Yeah. yeah, and I think, you know, to the point here, there's going to be different types of speakers and topics and mm -hmm. different types of audience, and that should dictate the format of your event. Um, we've also got um, a comment here from oh, one nice. of our audience members that pre-recorded content looks more polished and cleaner from an audience points of view, not limited by the constraints of a live delivery platform, which I think is, you know. So valid. Yeah, yeah. definitely. It does allow you, especially with look, feel, branding, um, especially for like really important presenters and everything, you get a more controlled mm. environment doing yeah. that. So yeah, definitely props on the, the statement there. Yeah, great. Thank you for that. Um, Henrietta. So tips so, for taking your physical conference. I know, nice little segue. I, I know, this is, so this is what you were talking about <laughs> and I'm just, I'm smiling because you are so passionate when it comes to physical conferences and I know that you've consulted with so many customers over the past few months <laughs> and the biggest thing that um, I think you've taught me is that just because you do, you're, you're going to have your agenda and you're going to run your event this way 
live and in a physical environment, you need to change it to the <laughs> online environment because people, as you can see, are attending more events, they're getting shorter attention spans. Yeah. So what are some other tips for taking your physical conference online? <clears throat> the number one is reworking your agenda. Yep. What you were doing for a face-to-face -face event isn't going to translate well mm. for a participant experience, yep. especially if you're asking them to commit to eight hours behind their desk at home oh, when they've got kids at home. Or, yeah, they've got <laughs> kids at home and they've also got so many different applications for their mm. working environment right now because they're not able to physically take themselves away from their work situation and go to a conference. Yep. They'll still have Teams open. They'll still have mm. chat open. They'll still have messages popping up and oh, something urgent's come up. So you've got to be quite clever about how you actually take mm. your agenda. And my recommendations for customers, one, extend it. Mm. Like you have an opportunity to extend your event now beyond that one day or two days. It could be a week, it could be two weeks. So we're talking about having maybe <clears throat> three or four different sessions on a day Absolutely. and then giving people the rest of their day back to catch up on work yep. and then just extending that so your content lives on for longer. Lives on for longer. It also allows your participants to know they're only committing for a small portion of time. So maybe look at your format like you would have a physical conference. Have your keynotes first mm. thing in the morning, get them really excited. But then at the end of the day, do maybe a panel session or a five fireside chat. Yeah. The other thing is not everything needs to be live mm. for a, a virtual conference. You want to commit to your, your big budget ones, so your, your keynotes, mm. the really high, I'm losing my words, but the really important speakers, mm. you want them to be live because they're your draw cards. Yeah. Anyone else on the agenda that you were using for different streams or different concurrent mm. sessions, have those as pre-recorded. Mm. Have them already pre-hosted on the site or each day release new content yeah. so that in between the two live sessions, you send an email to everyone mm. saying, hey guys, we've just now released three new sessions on our page. Go and have a look and then participate in an interactive chat. There's some really fun ways of doing this. And I guess that gives you more touch points with people. So if you just have like the one day conference and you have everything online and people are watching it back to back, you've had one time touch point with the people. So that's not necessarily great for you and your members or the people you're communicating with, but also for your sponsors. Yeah. Whereas you could potentially have every, a single day um, or half a day or certain sessions with sponsors, can't you? Yeah, you can use pre-recorded content for a, mm. a sponsor pre-rolls and post-rolls for sessions. Other things like if you are doing back-to-back -back sessions and you've got a break in the middle, why yeah. not actually have the sponsor come on live and talk about why they're sponsoring the event? Yeah. Using those simple things of dead air where you were having those catering breaks. So yeah. I was going to say recess of lunch. <laughs> <laughs> but I meant morning tea. Um, you can use that time yeah. to your advantage and actually give more value back to your speakers. The other things is when you're looking at the type of technology you're using for virtual conferences, it could be a mix of a couple of different things. It could be studio, like we're doing right now, mm -hmm. and remote presenters. So the real things is making sure you test and test and test, making sure that you're absolutely confident yeah. with anyone going live. If there is anything potentially going to go wrong, then you want to look at on-demand, um, creating recorded content that you can play as if live. But I think the absolute number one tip that we have is hire a virtual MC. Yes. You, we do this for our physical events. We do this yeah. for physical conferences. You need to do it for a digital one because mm. you need someone that's carrying the whole excitement and getting everyone... Mm. Um, kind of G'd up for your event and they can be hosting it from a studio like we're doing right now. They can do it remotely as well, but that's the person that's guiding mm -hmm. your participants through every session and everything and they should really bookend them. And so many MCs are now experienced in the virtual world. I know yeah. we've had conversations with so many of them and if you need advice on um, people to contact, feel free to get in touch, but these are people who have really dare I say, pivoted in a time like this <laughs> and really, you know, they've really stepped up their game to do things virtually and I think it's really hard for someone who is used to presenting face-to-face -to, -face to actually learn to present behind a camera. Yeah. And so I think it's important that you find an MC that's familiar with the online environment as well to make that work. But some great advice there and I think it's great <laughs> that we've now uncovered the types of people who responded to the event, also the types of applications yep. and what we're actually seeing on the rise. So virtual conferences, like we said, definitely on the rise. I also predict in the next, well, what's happening now, but the next time we do this report, virtual AGMs are going to skyrocket mm -hmm. um, because people People are now, with the guidelines provided by ASIC and whatnot, um, and the extension of that, people are now actually attending and holding more virtual AGMs and they're seeing record numbers, so definitely one to watch out for. I think award shows will also be up there. Oh yes, award shows, we're doing a few of those as well. <laughs> okay, let's get into the exciting part, which everyone loves, um, and I just want to preface this part of the presentation <laughs> by saying these 
are obviously, um, this is obviously um, responses from the yes. people who completed the survey. And when we go through the preferred days and times and durations, it's important not to get hung up and think, okay, this is the most popular date and time. Here's when I should hold my event. It's about looking beyond the data and seeing the different trends and saying, okay, if these are the most common days, why? And what does my audience want? And I think as we go through this as well, start to think about how you can figure out what's going to be more engaging for your audience. So I think it's also good to point out as well that with the response that you had, mm -hmm. over a third of it was for professional development. Exactly. So a lot of these times and day of the week and everything that we're talking about right now is majority for yep. professional development. So if you're looking at any other event type, it's probably not going to work for that time. Yep. So you need to be just putting that in there. And I think it's important to understand when other people are holding their events and to remember that, mm -hmm. you know, there is this thing of webinar fatigue, which people have been talking about for years and it hasn't happened yet. No. And if we keep running um, awesome events, and I don't think it will happen, but you don't necessarily want to be holding your events in peak times as well. No. You want to be different, the application as well. So we can see Tuesday and Wednesday came through as the most common um, mm -hmm. times and days of the week. That's usually the case and it has been for the past few years, but we've seen a drop on Thursdays as yeah, well. Massive drop on Thursdays. As we head to the end of the week. <laughs> um, and But as we can see, the Redback customers over the data that we analysed, 25% of people prefer Thursdays as well. So it's really about mixing up your content and finding out your audience. Yeah. I definitely think if you've been running webinars for a while um, or if you're new to webinars, you should be going to your audience and you should be asking them, when would you like to attend webinars? Yeah. Because it definitely makes it um, not only you're getting the right responses and you're then adapting whatever you're doing, but it also means that you're asking for this feedback and that's only a good thing. Yeah. I also think Mondays and Fridays. I love Monday Why and Friday not? events. Yeah, <laughs> you know, maybe some people, depends on the types of audiences in terms of Mondays and how hectic some Mondays are for people. But Friday afternoons, definitely um, mixing up, making it a little bit more casual, your fireside chat, chance, yeah. your panel discussions, those sorts of ones. And then we go into preferred times, and this is probably just a continuation of what we were talking about yeah. because mid-morning has always been so huge. However, I personally think that lunch and learns, and we can see here, aren't as popul popular as they once were. Yeah. No, I love lunch and learns. I, yes, we'd all like to have that work-life uh, <laughs> separation. Sorry. <laughs> um, but it's also a nice time for if you are going to unwind and you want to do something, it is that time that you can actually take it. And a lot of people, like you look at our customers, 29% mm. of them love the lunchtime yeah. slot, yeah. which is great to see. Afternoons, I still think, yeah, depending on the time of day when you're choosing to do it. Yeah. it again, to Sarah's point, and I absolutely agree, is that by going out to your community or your members or your customers or anything and getting mm -hmm. them involved early will also help you achieve greater numbers in the beginning because yeah. people are invested in the communications. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you need to understand, and most of you would probably know this already without even asking your audience, what, are you, what is your community doing in the morning, in the, at lunchtime and in the afternoon? Yeah. Are they physically behind a computer? Um, are they more the types of people who actually just want to watch on-demand content and therefore it doesn't matter when you want to hold your events? Yeah. So all this needs to be considered in the early stages of your events. And evenings, as we can see, uh, still, they've always been quite low, but we still have a huge amount of customers that run their events in the evenings. We do, and I think um, that's, but that's a lot of their community. Professional development. Professional yep. development, having to do it outside of hours. Yeah. The only thing that I would be talking to a lot of people about nowadays is just with everyone working from home and not having to like that transition time yeah. from like leaving the office mm. to go home afterwards yeah. and people are trying to do events over five o'clock or six o'clock at night is that's peak congestion on internet mm. networks yeah. at the moment because people are streaming yeah so it's again knowing about what's happening in the environment when you're trying to do your events as well and i think this takes us to the next part which is really what's driving the shift and i yeah. think the biggest thing that i would say when it comes to your times and your um times that you're the days of the week that you want to hold your events is think about what's happening in the world and how our working habits are changing. And yep. this, this is actually from me, this quote. So <laughs> I used to love mid-morning webinars, but working from home, my my days have changed. My working hours have changed. I'm, I don't have to necessarily spend time travelling into the office when I work from home. So I'm working from 7am. I get to I have breakfast. I get to probably just after lunch, 1.30, 2 o'clock, and I'm thinking, oh my God, I haven't had lunch yet because yeah. you're constantly on and you're constantly working. You're not going for those coffee runs with people in your office. You're no. not standing by the water cooler and having conversations with people and taking those breaks. You are always on. So having that 
3.30 afternoon, you know, that's sort of like the new snack time for me. <laughs> you know, OK, can I grab a cup of tea, sit down and watch half an hour, 45 minutes worth of content? No. Think about people's working habits and how they're changing. Um, but then also, you know, at that time of the day, is your audience going picking up the kids from school because right. they're now working from home and they have the ability to do that. So it really, really depends on your audience. And like I said, you're never going to get 100% live attendance rate. Or if you are, it's very well done. And I don't know what you're presenting. <laughs> Um, but really start to consider this and consider people's changing habits and the fact that they're going to continue to shift as well. Nice. I think that when you're looking at the, the shift and everything, mm. I, I always go back to the data and everything, and especially like you just mm. said, we're not looking for 100% attendance for the live event, but you are wanting to make sure you're tracking the on-demand. So that yeah. strategy around actually getting your attendance numbers afterwards and the proof back to the business about the success of it, it isn't the live stats, it's how many touch points, like how many people have actually seen the content. Mm. And that's when you'll see in the first three months after a live event, if you've done a great job at marketing, getting mm. touch points, going back to it, that's when you'll see that drive. Yeah. And this is also duration as well. Mm. So yes. our events are getting longer. They are, which I find really funny considering the previous year. <laughs> um, we were seeing so many events come up where during working hours of trying to go underneath that one hour into the 45-minute mark. Mm. Um, but yeah, 46% of people coming in, 60-minute duration, back mm. to the one hour, which yep. was our early days was always one hour for yeah. everything. And then, yeah, massive drop down to 33% for 45 minutes. I still really like the 45 minutes mm. and not committing to an hour. But again, it depends on content. This report, again, had a massive contributors of professional development, which would need that minimum of one hour for CPD. Mm. So that does play into it. But we can definitely see that still 33% is a large number for seeing different types of events coming in. 16%, 30 minutes. They have their place depending on it mm. is. The 90 minutes, though, I find really funny being mm. like 5%. I think and there definitely was this trend that we thought was coming around in the past 12 months or 12 months ago where people wanted a shorter, snackable content and yeah. it was these 30 minutes. I think that definitely has a place for on-demand content. Absolutely. So my attention span for on-demand content is going to be different than what it is live. So if you are running these hour events, depending on the type of content, when you do host it on demand, consider breaking that up into different chunks. So you may split it into two and have part one and part two so people don't have to actually invest in an entire hour. Or even to um, four 15-minute segments. Yeah, if you've great. got a facilitator that can really guide your content and you can have clean breaks when you yeah. edit, that's also another way to sort of mix it up as well. But when we look at the data of um, over 1,500 of our events in the past 12 months, here's the average duration of the events as well, which is um, also quite large. It's really large, and I think this does come into play when we look at the virtual conferences we've been doing. Because yeah. they are, and just to be transparent, with our events that we run, an event duration is off the single one. So if we did a full-day conference, that's just mm. one event. So, And we've done so many of these, so especially for the remote webinars, pushing that up to 73 minutes is massive. Mm. Yeah. And then we look at our studio jobs as well, where we had someone facilitating from a day, also done it. But mm. our customer venue ones, before we had to stop going to customer venues, mm. those are generally your hybrid events. So those were the, those longer um, keynotes and plenary sessions and everything that mm. we were doing. So that's why our minutes are so high. Mm. Um, but it is, it's because people are utilizing, using the event types differently. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so once again, um, interesting data, not something that you're going to treat as gospel, but oh, just God. really interesting to see how others are running their events and how you can adapt that to the way you're running events. So we're two thirds of the way in, we've got 15 minutes left. So please ask any questions that come through. We're going to go into the last section now. Um, and this is a fun section. I think it's all <laughs> fun, guys. So really, um, let's talk about preferred format, because mm -hmm. this is something that um, I'm very, very happy to see in the report. And there's a few things where I was like, yes, I could have written a myself. Um, but I think format is definitely overlooked when it comes to events. We spend obviously a lot of time on content and presenters and technology, and so we should. But the format is also something that should be played around with. And yeah. something, if you're running a webinar program, it's good to mix things up a bit and keep it fresh. And I am so glad that we see moderators taking a front seat. Um, the fact that we have two people discussions as something that's rated higher, but then we've got panel discussions as well. Yeah. So we're talking what? 49%, almost half of people prefer more than one presenter, mm -hmm. is music to my ears because it just makes it so much more engaging. It makes it more engaging and it's easier for the presenters as well. Mm. If Sarah or I were just sitting here right now, 
by ourselves trying to do yeah. this report, it could get a little monotone. You, mm. you would lose the excitement, but we feed off each other. Yeah. And we bounce different ideas. So yeah. having a format where you have the two people, Sarah also does all the moderation for me. Mm. So I can't touch the slide clicker. I'm not trusted. I don't trust him with a slide clicker. <laughs> There's a difference. But it means that she gets to steer the conversation. Yeah. So she knows her talking points. I have my yeah. ones as well. And it makes it so much more enjoyable. And you get to actually have fun with it. Now, it's not gospel. There mm. will be event types where you need to have that single presenter. Yep. And you can't always have a moderator for it. But to, exactly to your point, it's breaking up your content, knowing how things are going to go. I personally love the panel discussions and mm. fireside chats, a more casual approach to them, because slides are needed for a lot of things, but that's not the be all and end all. If you can carry an event by conversation, it's much more enjoyable. And there are certain events where there's definitely the need for a moderator. So obviously yes. virtual conferences we discussed. Yep. Virtual AGMs are crucial. Yes. <laughs> you need to have a chairperson at those events. And also just consider your presenters. And as I said, not everyone's going to be a natural presenting no. behind the camera. And we'll go into presenters in a moment, but you'll see how crucial it is that your presenters actually convey their passion and enthusiasm. And sometimes the best way to do that is to have a moderator or facilitator. And these can be hired through managed providers, but use someone in your organisation that could be right next to you. What I have seen, Michael, over the past few months is a rise in the amount of CEOs taking um, front and centre when it comes to their events. And especially Especially when everything sort of hit us in sort of March, April, and people started to change all their events and go online, there was an abundance of CEOs becoming the moderator as soon as the webinar started. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. Yep. There was this empathetic, caring speech around why they've chosen to go online and thank you for helping us on this journey. Most people renamed their series as well. So it had this really nice feel to it. And I think it's really important to consider the goal of your program and the branding of your program as well. Um, every single time you run a webinar, it is a reflection of your brand. Absolutely. You know, your brand is much more than just your logos on the slides. It's about the person presenting and how the moderator is controlling that. And half the time, if you're presenting and it's just a single presenter, then you probably aren't going to remember call to actions or time or technology. Yeah. So you need a moderator to actually manage that. And they're really underrated um, and definitely don't sort of um, pinch your pennies when it comes to moderation. <laughs> And just on that, here's some tips for moderation as well. Um, and we've got so much more content on tips for moderators, so feel free to get in touch if you want some more. But they need to understand the content and presentation ahead of time. Yeah. It's not a matter of your presenter and your moderator just turn up on the day, hi, how are you? They need to understand the tone and the energy and the types of events that they want to convey and yeah. the emotions, don't they? Absolutely. Like, you don't want someone to be cold yeah. and disconnected <laughs> from the content. That's the main Yeah, scripts are not recommended. No. However, it's, it's this fine line. I think with moderation in rehearsing and you don't want to be too rehearsed where you're reading from a script. Um, if it is more formal, maybe an auto cue might be necessary, but you want to have this organic flow and this connection between your moderator and facilitator because it will definitely break through the technology barrier as well. And also tips on how to guide them back to the topic if they start to waffle like I generally do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and the other thing is avoiding the long bios and getting to oh. the point. Yeah, well, look, people already know who the speakers are. That yeah. generally should be on your marketing anyway, links mm. off to LinkedIn. And you don't want to disconnect people from the content because at the beginning you've either started doing a company spiel or you've started being too salesy yeah. around the content or anything. That's really jarring to it. It should just start straight away and yep. go into it. The yeah. only thing that you might want to do at the beginning is just remind people how to engage with the <laughs> platform. But even that, you guys saw it today, we had a housekeeping video yeah. played at the beginning, so we don't even have to do that. Yeah, exactly. Um, keep it simple, I say, and keep focus on that. Um, well, here we go. This is interesting, isn't it? Oh, I love this sort of <laughs> yep. stuff. Oh, look, like we look at the most important things at the participant level and what they're doing when they're coming into an event. And year on year, this comes in. And no matter how much time we tell our customers, it is the truth. Mm. It's crystal clear audio quality is the number one. Yep. Like people are going to forgive... Um, a poor video camera from someone's mm. laptop if they've got good audio. Yeah. But if they've got bad audio, people are not going to stay online. That's the main, that's just the rule. Yeah. It's so much easier to walk away from an event. I know we talk about that in a bit, but that's mm. the thing. Like, you don't want anything that's going to discourage people from actually staying online. So, number one, crystal clear audio. Number two is being able to see the presenters on a webcam, which is great, but not always needed. Mm. And that also does come into play that if your presenters aren't really comfortable in front of camera, do not force them to yeah. have it because your audience don't need it as much as that audio. Yeah. So you are trying to play to the strengths. The ability to download resources and additional stuff from the actual page is great to mm. see that it's still in there. Yeah. Um, I find it really funny that zero for being able to ask a private question. Mm. I think people are getting more into the actual public chats and everything. Mm. Um, 
And then the ability to connect with other attendees via open chat. Yeah, that was at zero as well, so just actually don't listen to me. Well, I think it just reinforces <laughs> the fact that you really want um, audio to be your priority you in do. your event. No. And I think um, having backup plans is really important when it comes to audio and testing and training. Um, and we could do a whole session more on the sort of technical stuff oh when God, it yeah. comes to your webinars, um, but definitely some um, room for... Room for expansion on that topic, isn't there? The passion is everything. Yes, it is. So um, this is something, there's so many things that have changed um, in the report over the past eight years. However, this is something, and um, you can go back and read every report, it's <laughs> been the same every single year. And this is when we ask people, what is the most important thing to you when it comes to um, preferences um, and presenters, presenters and your events? Um, presenters are enthusiastic and engaging. Um, yeah. So... This is huge because in an event, an online event, people can just close down your browser and leave. They don't have that embarrassment of getting up and walking away. So it's really important to understand what's going to keep them online and what's going to keep them engaged. And an engaging presenter online obviously trumps everything else. Everything else. And yeah. it's important that you have these things. You want easy technology, but you don't need to, you can't control that. Or you can, yeah. but your provider who you work with can assist with that. The content needs to be delivered as promised, but you need to work with your presenters to create content and make sure what you're marketing is the same as what's been spoken about. Um, but passion and enthusiasm is so important. And as we can see, almost half of the people actually said that. Um, it also, we also ask people around attendees' personal preferences. If they could improve online events, what would they actually want? Um, so 51% want access to presenters after a webinar. Yep. And we've seen this rise in online forums after events as well. So people redirecting either to discussion groups or creating their own online communities. And there's platforms out there that do that now. 22% want to submit questions verbally. So there's sort of two ways to do this, um, and that's opening up the lines for people on the actual event through VoIP, which isn't really recommended because you don't know what you're going to get on the other end. But there is another way where you can actually have people dial into a teleconference. Yeah. And you can have a managed solution. You can have people dial in and ask questions that way. Or video chat as well. And I I don't I can't guarantee anything. <laughs> um, but I think that um, in the next 12 months, we're going to see an increase in this. So if anyone's watched Q&A um, on the ABC, you will actually see a lot of people pre-submit video questions beforehand. So getting your audience to pre-submit those questions beforehand, and we do that in the registration, like yep. written, but getting them to do that via video and then playing those videos in the event, I think is a great it's idea. It's a good opportunity for you when you've done the, the text-based yeah. pre-submission of questions and you've reviewed them leading up to the yeah. event you're yeah. like you know what that would actually be a really good video one yeah. reach out to the person who submitted mm. you've got their email address and say hey would you mind using your iphone yeah just film yourself little, doing it yeah i'll put it up the other thing is like and this is what i was going to talk about for increasing live attendance yeah. i finally came around to it is with that 51 percent of people who want to actually have access to the presenters mm. after the webinar this is really good to have that secondary event that happens straight afterwards mm. but limited seating so first 100 people that register will get invited or first 100 people mm. who attend the event will receive the invitation afterwards to join our LinkedIn discussion yeah. group. Mm. So then that way it drives more people into it because they have another touch point afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and this is just another thing as well, and this also talks to why do people drop off their events? So 86% yeah. admit to dropping off events, and that's a reality. It's also 20% up from last year as well. So it we've is. got high expectations. Here are some things that you need to make sure you have. So the content, like I said, make sure that it's shared with your presenter so you're marketing and talking about the same thing. If you're running lead generation events, call to actions need to be really subtle, yeah. I think, um, and it's more about nurturing people after your webinar, which is, once again, a whole different topic. You need to make sure your event runs to time, and I'm a stickler for this, and I understand that we've only got seven more minutes, so I'm going to be really, really... Um, just Let's Speed it up. Yeah, I'm going to make sure that I get there in the end. <laughs> but if you do run over time, that's okay. Just let people know that that's going to be the case and respect people's time. But I definitely think if I register for something and I hop online and someone starts talking about themselves for about 10 minutes and talking about their product or service, I'm done. Yeah. No, well, it's also with looking at the um, the increase in volume of yeah. webinars as well. Yeah. If you haven't grabbed their attention in the beginning, no. and staying online, there's another one happening. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I future think, yeah, I just want to spend a few moments just talking about the future of digital events before we get to a few questions that have come through. Um, so, you know, 79% say virtual is as good or better. Yeah. Um, but what do you think we need to make sure that digital events are here to stay and completely compelling? 
Oh, look, there's, I, I keep looking at the strategies that we're working mm. with some customers. Yeah. And it's not the one size fits all or even the fact that you're looking at replacing all your physical events. It is really having that defined strategy about how virtual is going to work with mm. physical and how live is going to play in and where on demand is going to mm. play in and how you keep getting people back to your content. Yeah. Those are the kind of the, the main things that you're looking at. Like yeah. virtual is definitely, so a lot of people are saying it's better. And I think that's just because it's easier access to different and speakers. It's present. It's present. It's, it's right now we have, it's right at our fingertips. So afterwards, mm. people are going to be expecting the same international speakers. They're going to expect the same events. Yeah. And so there's going to have to be that really cool strategy. But I think, yeah, the, Definitely not at the peak like we talked mm. about before, but that peak is going to constantly evolve. And I think it is this unified strategy around what's live, what's tied in with a physical event. Can my content be yeah. on demand only? So there's a lot of different touch points you mm. get to do. So, yeah. But also just be creative. You guys are only limited to your creative creativity when it comes to digital events. So be bold, try stuff new. And I think the other thing is people's attitudes are changing yeah. and they have changed to events. So therefore, you've got huge potential when it comes to creating your events and you can have so much fun with these now. I also think the fact that four out of ten people have attended for online entertainment, I, love that. I think there's going to be a huge increase in that just to further engage people and resonate with your employees, especially if a lot of um, businesses continue to work from home. So like you mentioned earlier, we're doing a lot of virtual awards night, there's mm -hmm. charity fundraisers, there's meet, um, comedy events as well. Yep. So I think you're right, it's definitely endless in terms of what you can achieve. Yeah. Um, but I, I just want to get to some questions Perfect. now. Um, it is a bit of a meaty report, so definitely download and take a look at some of those results and feel free to get in touch if you have any um, questions. Yeah, feel free to connect on LinkedIn. Yeah, I just um, we've got a question from Belinda around the findings of the report. So are we going to change up the way that we run digital events? So this is very interesting. Um, so, Belinda, we have actually done a few things um, and I've sort of taken, a, I've sort of extracted a few things out of this and there's two parts. It's what we're consulting. Yes. to our customers on how to run their events, but also for our own internal events. So we are um, experimenting a lot more with on-demand content as well. So one of the things that we've done is training presenters is huge for us yes. and the report telling us or reinforcing that presenters are very crucial when it comes to your events. We've actually created an online presenter hub full of on-demand content, which we're yeah. launching next week. Um, and that's on our webinars.com.au website, which is getting refreshed. So I think for us... Hearing what people are wanting and the fact that presenters are so important, it forced us to look at our content because all of our content was for our customers, whereas we had to create content for our presenters to help them run better events. So that's the first thing. The other thing we've done is we realise that on-demand content is important, but I also think it needs to be more accessible. Yes. And I think in the past, um, for all of our on-demand content, people would go watch it afterwards, but they'd have to enter their email address to join what we've done is we've changed it up a bit now and we're giving it access to everyone. So all of our webinars are on our website. We export the video file and we actually caption it. So we've got burnt on captions so anyone can actually yep. read it um, and it's completely compliant and accessible for anyone. And then we actually export a transcript of our content and then we create a blog on that as well for marketing purposes. So we're starting to reuse our content in a variety of ways and just get more creative with it. Yeah, we're definitely doing things differently with our customers mm. from the report as well. And I think it's some customers are really open to trying new things. Others steer mm. a little clear of it until yep. they're forced to do yep. it and everything. But I do think it's actually a good challenge for us to look at a couple of these things and maybe create an example of saying, hey, from mm. the report findings, yep. this is what video questions look like. This is what yeah. this and actually create a, a dummy. We'll do it instead of a live one, maybe yeah. just an on-demand piece of content, but that'd be a fun thing for us to work on. Yeah. And the whole virtual AGM side for us has just opened up a huge realm yeah. of possibilities, a whole new product line. We're working with a lot of peak bodies as well to make sure that people are running um, successful virtual AGMs. And um, one of the things we started to experiment with, but we didn't really continue, but I want to continue, is the whole concept of short, snappy webinars on a Friday afternoon and running events at different times. Um, I still want to do webinars and wine. Yeah, I know. He's been begging <laughs> me to do that for a while, but we'll see. Um, okay, we've got another question. So what are your predictions for live events making a comeback? So... Um, you oh, just look. briefly alluded to this. Yeah, I did. And I think they're absolutely going to be coming back. But there's <laughs> going to be now, I think every live event will have some form of virtual element tied yeah. to it. Whether it's a pre-event or a post-event, yep. so you're extending the touch points of the event or actually streaming that event out 
yeah. to people that couldn't travel. Um, yeah, I think event, like physical events are definitely coming back. There's always going to be a need for them, but they're going to completely, there will always, I feel, have a virtual element somehow. I can't to. wait for physical events to come back. I can't <laughs> wait to cheese that glass of champagne with someone and have a conversation with them that's different. Yeah. But I think the thing to remember is in the, for the past 10 years, especially in the US, physical events occur with a hybrid element. Yeah. So people don't run physical events or any sort of um, virtual, or any sort of conferences, especially when it comes to membership-based conferences, unless they have that hybrid event because it does work and there's so much success. So I feel like yeah. this, everything that's happened in the past few months has forced us into that. And I feel like it's just going to open up so many possibilities, not only for you as organisers and your attendees, but also for your sponsors as well. Maybe the other big change that we've looked at this year, and I know we're right on time, but we're, we stream to all platforms. Yeah. That's the other main thing. Like We're not yeah. limited by this sort of stuff. So when we look at, especially the virtual conferences, there are mm. amazing platforms out there that we are working with customers now to their platform of choice mm. and helping them with the streaming stuff. So, yeah, possibly to the endless. Yeah, and we recognise now there's different platforms for different things. And yeah. sometimes our streaming platform isn't always relevant. Sometimes we'll actually use another platform that a customer has. So I think it's about us all working together to develop great content and compelling content um, to deliver your message when it matters most. And that brings us to 11.45 and I promised you guys right I was day to time. So <laughs> thank you everyone for joining. It's been great having you online. Download the report, contact us for information. Um, but thank you, Michael. It's great always having thank you, you on Thank you, Sarah. Well. I loved it. Hostess with the mosters. That's me. <laughs> <Are you? laughs> all right. Thanks, guys. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.